Welcome back to Fast Gadgets. I thought today we would go over a video I shot way back in 2016 around the time I began this channel and it was one of the videos that seems to do really well. It's gotten over 50,000 views and I will put the link to the original video down in the description. The title was five reasons that I use Fedora Linux. Now just to appease those that will automatically be naysayers and come out and say this um, I am quite aware that Linux is only a kernel but for those of us who work in the industry we don't go around calling it GNU Linux or GNU Richard Stallman Linux only the kernel um, we just call it Linux because quite frankly the kernel is a critical portion of it and it's the start of all of it so that's why we just call it Linux so um, if you were to correct somebody in the industry, they probably would laugh at you. Um, I kind of get a chuckle out of it whenever I see those quotes. So it tells me a lot when I see that kind of um, comment. And, and if you want to leave it, that's perfectly fine. But I'm just letting you know now. Anyway, five reasons why I use Fedora Linux from back in 2000, 2016. Are they still valid? The first one that I talked about was ready to go after installation. So some of the different distributions that are out there are a little bit more advanced for those that are more capable in Linux, like Slackware or Arch Linux. Um, some of the BSD installations, they don't even come with graphical interfaces, for example. So you do have to install the interface. You do have to install each of the packages that you want. Now, is it difficult for me? No, it's not. And many of you will say it's not difficult at all. I just go ahead and do it. But I'm thinking of a distribution that is fully open source that you can easily grab, download, put on a USB drive, and then do an installation. And to me, Fedora Linux is one of the best distributions that allow you to do all of the above. So it's an easy installation it takes into account if you already have windows on your computer which i think is really nice um, so if you want to install fedora linux and you have windows it'll actually look at the windows ntfs partition if it's taking up the entire drive and it will resize that partition for you so that it can make room for your Fedora installation. Other Linux distros like Ubuntu and those that come from Ubuntu also do that as well. Um, but again, Fedora is one of the originals. So I think that's really nice the way it's set up and it saves you from blasting windows away and you can do a pretty simple straightforward dual boot. Number two, and I still believe this, it's truly open source. So it's one of those distributions that to this point, at least as far as I know, it does not have any code in it that's not open source. And I think that that's a really more of a philosophy of mine. I look for a distribution that is fully open source and Thinking of my dis my Linux install right now on my main computer or on my laptop, there is no closed source software on there. I don't even have drivers for the video cards on there anymore um, that are closed code that have come from a particular company. Do other for-profit companies contribute to that code yes I'm sure they do like Intel or AMD um, but the only way it's going to end up in Fedora is if it's truly open source and again that's why I say it's really a philosophical thing I mean how important is it that you use a distro that's only open source well it all depends on who you are and what you're using it for in reality for me um, I want 100% open source, not because I'm a hardliner and I won't use other uh, operating systems or software packages that are not open source. It's just that if I'm going to be in Linux, 
I want to try to experience the whole open source initiative and be able to say, okay, well, the distribution that I'm using doesn't have any proprietary closed source code in it um, that potentially in the future you could have to pay for it. I think that's, that's pretty cool. Number three, uh, Red Hat and Fedora are consistent with their quality and they are very long lasting. So originally in my older video, I talked about the fact that, you know, as far as Linux distributions go, um, Red Hat goes all the way back to the beginning. I remember when Red Hat was just a, a group of people that got together to create, you know, a Linux distribution. And it was one of the first, it's not the only one, but one of the first. And once Red Hat became, you know, a for-profit company, they still were working with source code. So they became a service organization. So they offered services, but still Red Hat, the server operating system is 100% open source. They no longer offer the compiled source code for you. If you want to do it yourself, you can. And certainly others have. CentOS, of course, is a bit for bit version of Red Hat and it's compiled source code. They just stripped out all the Red Hat logos. So one of the things that Red Hat did was begin the Fedora Project Foundation, which is kind of like a part of Red Hat, but not really. And they are responsible for kind of the experimentation. Now, whenever somebody says, yeah, that's why you shouldn't use Fedora because it's experimental, that is not true at all. It is solid um, gold candidate release code designed for actual use in the industry. So it's not like if you're using Fedora, um, you're getting some kind of experimental code that could crash any time. I found it to work really well. So that's my opinion. Um, why not use Ubuntu? Well, there, it's not that I have anything wrong with it, but it is from a for-profit company and it does have some proprietary non-open source code in it, um, as well as advertisers built in, which I understand Canonical needs to make a dime, but why do that? If I'm going to do that, I might as well just use Windows. I would rather have a fully open source product that I could use. Now, number four, I talked about the interface and how modern it was. And I was referring to GNOME 3. Many people did not like the GNOME 3X interface when it came out. They were honestly downright angry. A lot of that really surprised me, but then again, I thought back and it, I realized, you know, many of the Linux users have come from the Windows universe and they become kind of irritated with such a wild interface change. If you look at GNOME 3 and compare it to Mac OS, they are so similar. I mean, to the point where it's fairly clear to me that GNOME 3 was a, a not an out and out copy of Mac OS, but it took some of the uh, finer points of Mac OS and some of the ways that we move around applications, for example, um, or we do searching. It's definitely very much the same as Mac OS. And since the majority of the body of Linux users are probably more familiar with Windows and less Mac OS, I think it irked them. And many people talk about making GNOME 3 look like GNOME 2X or switching to KDE or the Mate interface or anything but GNOME 3. The other thing about GNOME 3 is the interface kind of reminds me of a cell phone. And I really think in GNOME's thought, in their idea of setting it up the way they did, was, hey, this is going to be brilliant for a tablet. I mean, this will work really well on a tablet and, and, and it'll work really well on a cell phone too, on a smartphone. So we've created this interface that will work with 
all of the different settings are not settings but hardware so whether it's tablet or smartphone or whatever and I don't know if that was such a good idea but I personally like the GNOME 3 interface. The only reason I don't use it regularly is because it doesn't really do good with scaling for high DPI 4K displays, which I'm going to get into in the next and fifth and final item is why I'm using Fedora. Now, this is more of a KDE thing. Number five was how good... Um, the support is for high DPI displays. Now at the time it was a Fedora thing because I tried all the different distributions and none of them could take account for uh, 4K displays. So GNOME 3 will do it, but some of the applications don't work right in 4K, so it's a little bit of a problem. And I actually switched to KDE because it does a really good job of scaling for 4K displays, including the applications, which I think is very nice. And one of those key applications for me is Kden Live. So I do all my editing in KDE and Kden Live. KDE or Kden Live will run fine in GNOME, and I can kind of fudge the KDE, the KDE settings to make GNOME at least appear relatively normal, but it's just easier to use it in KDE Plasma. I don't use KDE Plasma because I think the GNOME interface isn't any good. I actually prefer it, so if I could, scaling and everything worked well and uh, KDE applications looked good, some of the icons are missing, some of the settings aren't quite right when you're in GNOME, they just look better in KDE Plasma. So I usually end up in KDE Plasma and it's not because of its Windows-like interface, it's because of how it displays applications, it just works the best for me. So those are the original five reasons. I thought I would go over them again because to me they're still interesting and it's really sad that, you know, a year, two years down the road here, it's still an issue with high, DB, high DPI displays. And GNOME 3, although it does a really good job at 1080p, then it's fine with 1080p. Um, it isn't all that great with 4K. When you open up the browser, for example, you have to um, do Control Plus to zoom in to about 250%. Well, if I'm in KDE Plasma, I don't have to do that at all. The scaling is already set correctly for everything, including applications, and they work exactly the way I like. So uh, it's just easier for me to use KDE, but I'm hoping GNOME will come along. I'm not sure what it's gonna take. I feel like the developers don't even look at high DPI as a concern of any sort. Um, if you look at GIMP, which is a really cool software package, Forget it in 4K. The icon set in GIMP simply won't work in 4K. I mean, I've actually learned where each of the little tools is, the icon for the tools, so I don't even need to know what it is. If I want paintbrush or I want the paint bucket, the fill bucket, uh, I know what row and what little dot to pick on the screen, literally, because it's so tiny. So that's a real problem for me uh, and I don't feel like developers whether they're for applications or for you know distributions of the operating system are actually looking at the high DPI display I know that in some ways they do but they really see it as a total backseat um, and that's part of the problem with Linux they uh, the developers you know I'm not gonna say they spend most of their time in the command line but I would say that the graphical interface at the highest DPI settings is not really the biggest concern they certainly want to be compatible but it's not like they're driven like a for-profit product like Windows or Mac OS right so not a big deal not a deal breaker with me the monitor I have on the computer I'm using now is a 1080p and my 4K display scales nicely in KDE Plasma so I have my solution 
and I still get to use all the apps. They're all open source. Uh, they're from a distro that's been around a long time and has an excellent track record and is trustworthy. And when you do an installation, you're ready to go. I've had to actually uh, blow away my Linux distribution for one reason or another and just do a fresh install. And I was amazed at how quickly I was back up and running within I would say about 30 to 45 minutes after doing the install, there's a couple apps that don't install by default, like Caden Live, and I installed those and I'm in business. I'm ready to go. And because they're all open source and easily available and they're the tools that I use, I know what I need, kind of like anybody who's doing Windows or Mac or whatever, and I can get up and running very, very, very quickly on Linux and it's my chosen OS. So hopefully you'll go back and check out my original video and let me know what you think about the updates and my opinions still stand on those five reasons just maybe a little bit altered. Some of them you know need to be addressed by the Linux developer community in general and hopefully they will. But otherwise really really enjoying using Linux. Thank you for watching. As always, like and subscribe. If you really liked it, consider sharing. And I'll see you next time on Fast Gadgets.